It's just lovely to see you all again. Um, since we were here last, we've added to the family yet again. So we've another grandchild. I was telling the ladies last night, we do girls very well in our family. We've now got eight granddaughters and one grandson. So Charlie remains, for a while he was praying every time there was a new baby that another boy would come, but now he's actually quite enjoying the fact that he's the only one. So he, he remains the kingpin, so he's very, very happy about that. So I got to spend uh, most of September in Edinburgh with my daughter there, and uh, so now I'm back in Scotland again, so I might even start to get the accent if I keep coming this often. <laughs> um, and also when we come here, um, you are very, very good to us and we get to stay in a lovely hotel. So I always feel like I'm as, as if I'm on holiday when I come to Aberdeen. And, you know, whenever you get to stay in a hotel, we've had some work done to our house this year. And so we have been redecorating and I've been thinking, you know, what color to paint walls and, you know, what cushions to buy, which actually drives Paul around the bend. He says, I've got an obsession with cushions and he doesn't quite get it, which he continually throws off the bed and off the couch. But um, when it's your own home, you think about how to decorate it and how to make it, you know, comfortable, etc., etc. But when you go into a hotel room, you just accept it for what it is, because you know it's a temporary, you're only, we're going to be here for a couple of nights, you don't think, oh, I'll call the decorators, I don't like that shade on the wall, I'll call them in and get them to repaint it, because you know it is temporary. And, you know, when you really think about that, that's a bit like the Christian life, because sometimes I think that we spend time on things that don't have any long-term benefit that we put our energies into things that really won't last and, and will pass away, whereas as Christians, we're called to a different viewpoint. We're called to live in a different way. And it's what Paul was talking to the church um, in Colossae about. And I want to read a passage from that letter to you from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. And that's what I want to talk, talk to us about this morning, that, you know, as Christians, we don't want to invest our lives in things that are only temporary and things that are going to pass away. There was an old song that used to say, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. And so this is what Paul says to the Colossians, chapter three, verses one to four. Since then, you have been raised with Christ, Set your heart on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you, you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory." When you meet Jesus, when you have come to Jesus and you have a relationship with Jesus, that you realize that he died for you and that you invite him into your life and you make him the Lord of your life and you are forgiven and you are made new. What Paul says is when that happens, then not only do we understand Jesus' death and what Jesus' death did for us in terms of us being able to be reconciled to God, in terms of us being able to be forgiven, in terms of us being able to receive the very life of God living in us. But then Jesus not only died, he rose from the dead and he is now seated it at the right hand of God. And what Paul is saying is he, in, in these verses here is not only when you come to Christ, do, did you die with him, but you have been raised with him. So you are seated in heavenly places. We, we're seated here in this building this morning, but actually God sees you. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, God sees you as seated in heavenly places with Christ. That gives us 
a whole different perspective on our lives. And honestly, I think that as Christians, we sometimes don't spend enough time thinking about that. We think about the immediate. We think about what's currently happening in our lives. We are earthbound. But Paul is wanting to help us to understand that we actually are seated with Christ in heavenly places, whatever is going on in our lives this morning. And so therefore, I think that what Paul is saying is, he's, and in fact, it's very clear, he says, set your hearts on things above. And in verse two, he says, set your minds on things above. He's saying, I want you to have an eternal mindset. And that eternal mindset will have such an impact on your life here and now. It's not that the two things are unrelated. It actually will affect how you live here and now. It's a way of thinking. Set your minds. I mean, um, Ecclesiastes talks about the fact that God has set eternity in the hearts of men. So that means that even people who don't know Jesus have some sense that there is more to life than what they are, const they are currently experiencing. But not everybody is actually in tune with that deep knowing that's on the inside of us. But you see, your mindset is determined by what you believe. Your mindset will be determined by what you believe. And it will determine how you see things. I mean, I remember um, years and years ago, I had a certain set of beliefs about the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I knew that he existed. I knew that he was part of the Godhood. I knew he was part of the Trinity. Um, but he was sort of not that real to me. And also, I believed that what we read about in the New Testament and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and all of those things were not for today. Those things had passed away. They were not for today. I had a set of belief, beliefs that affected my mindset. So therefore, I had no expectation that God would come and touch someone who was sick. I had no expectation that God would move in miraculous ways and, and, and do powerful things in our day as was done in the earth early church, I had no expectation. But when I started to understand that my, that my belief system was so narrow and was, was so unable to comprehend that the very power that raised Christ from the dead lived in me and that the Holy Spirit was alive and moving in our world today and he was distributing his gifts in the body of Christ. Once my belief system started to change, then my mindset started to change and I started to have a different set of expectations. And so what Paul is saying is when you have an eternal mindset, it will change how you view your world. I love the Narnia Chronicles. Um, I love C.S. Lewis. Uh, we, we claim him. He was, he was an Ulster man. We claim him as our, as our own. And, uh, and one of my favorite books in the Narnia Chronicles is The Silver Chair. And there's a character in the Narnia Cro Chronicles called Puddle Glum. And I love Puddle Glum because you, Paul always says to me, he says, Priscilla, you're such a pessimist. And I go, no, I'm a realist. I'm just like Puddle Glum. I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist. And, uh, and in the silver chair, there's this little piece that Puddleglum says to the, to the white witch that always inspires me. Because to me, it shows someone who has an eternal mindset. And I do want to read it to you this morning. Because the white witch has, has caught Puddleglum and the three children, and she has them underground, and she's trying to convince them that the kingdom, the dark kingdom that she has created is the only one that there is. And so this is what he says to her, one word, ma madam, one word. There's one more thing to be said. Suppose we have only dreamed or made up all those things, trees and grass and sun and moon and stars, and Aslan himself. Suppose we have, then all I can say is that in that case, the made up things seem a good deal more important than the real ones. Suppose this black pit of a kingdom of yours is the only world. 
Well, it strikes me as a pretty poor one. And that's a funny thing when you come to think of it. We're just babies making up a game if you're right. But four babies playing a game can make a play world which licks your real world hollow. That's why I'm going to stand by the play world. I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan to lead it. I'm going to live like a Narnian, and I can, ev- and, and I, I can do that even if there isn't a Narnia. So thanking you kindly for our supper. If these two gentlemen and the young lady are ready, we're leaving your court at once. We're setting out in the dark to spend our lives looking for overland. Not that our lives will be very long, I should think, but that's a small loss if the world's as dull a place as you say. And so he has this understanding that while he's surrounded by the darkness that the white witch has created, there is something more. He knows, he's seen it, he's felt it, he's touched it. And so like, like Puddlegum, we are called to live in a world which has been impacted by Satan, which has been impacted by sin, and to say, not only to ourselves, but to the people that God has put us amongst, this isn't all that there is. You know, God has called you to Aberdeen. He has called you to make a difference in this city, in this community. He's called you to make a difference in this nation. But you know, you are not just about improving people's lives, and you want to improve people's lives, but you are called to connect them to an eternal viewpoint, because you want them to know that their eternal future can be secured. You don't just want to improve the present. You want them to understand that they too have a secure eternal future when they come into contact with the living God. And so I believe that an eternal mindset is absolutely crucial. And, you know, some people talk about, you know, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. But you, I honestly don't think you can be heavenly minded and then be of no earthly good. Because it's when you are heavenly minded that you want to make a difference in the world, that it changes. Because if there isn't anything else, if this dark world is all that there is, then why don't we just live for ourselves? Why don't we just make it all about us? It's only because we have an eternal mindset that we, like Paul, want to live to make a difference in this world. Paul talks about, um, in one of his other letters, he talks about fruitful labor, and he talks about working while it's still day. We only do have, even those who are younger, we only do have a finite time here on earth to make a difference. And when we have an eternal mindset, that will motivate us to serve others. Actually, I love coming to Kings because honestly, every time I come, I hear other stories about how people's lives have been rescued as they've come amongst you, as they've met Jesus, but also because this body is willing to sacrifice to serve those who are in need. And I really believe that You have an amazing vision as a church, but that vision has always got to be underwritten by an eternal mindset, because otherwise you'll eventually give up. You'll eventually drop out. But when you know that this is about people's eternal future, then it's worth making the sacrifices for. It's worth not living for yourself and just your own little life and your own little family, but that this is the family of God and we are going to serve. We are going to make ourselves available. An eternal mindset really does change everything. There is a lost world around us. There there are people who don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, let alone anything else. And we have an amazing message of hope that says not only can God invade your life right here and right now and make a difference, but that ultimately you can know an eternal future secure because of your relationship with him. And so I believe that Paul is saying to us, make sure that you have a mind 
that is set. It's a mindset, but it's a mind that is set on eternal things, on the things that are going to last. And then the second thing is it's an eternal mindset. And this is similar, but just slightly different. I think what Paul is saying is we need an eternal perspective. Um, I know with Instagram these days, people often post, you know, if they're on holiday, they'll post this beautiful photograph and they'll go, this is the view that I woke up to this morning. And the rest of us here in cold, rainy, well, for us, cold, rainy Belfast, we're going, oh, I wish I was waking up to that view this morning as well. And what Paul is saying is, what view did you wake up to this morning? What vista did you look out on this morning? Was it just what you're facing right here and now, which is difficult, which is hard, which is a struggle, where you can't exactly see how it's going to work out? Is that your view this morning? Because what Paul is saying, he wants us to set our hearts on things above. That's in verse 2. Set your heart on things above. Paul comes back to this theme over and over and over again. He says in Corinthians, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. Do you know something? We proclaim it in our worship. We believe it. We believe that our God is a God of breakthrough, who can change every situation, who can bring answers and solutions to the problems that we're facing. But you and I know that the truth is this side of heaven. Sometimes we don't get the breakthrough. Sometimes the answer doesn't come just as we think it might come. But that is not the end of the story when you're a Christian. And honestly, I think in the difficulties and the troubles of this life, unless we understand that we have read the end of the book and we know the outcome, there are times when it does seem that the breakthrough isn't coming, that it's hard to keep going. It is an eternal mindset. It is an eternal viewpoint. It is an eternal perspective that enables you to have the strength to keep on going. I don't know what you're like when you're reading a book, but if I'm reading a book that is particularly tense and you're not sure what's going to happen, um, then sometimes I can't help myself. I, and I, and I, I don't want to do it, but sometimes it's getting so tense and I go, I'm just going to have to read the end because then I can come back and I can read through all the rest and not get so stressed out. Honestly, sometimes reading books for me is a stressful experience. And so therefore, when I flick to the end and go, oh, good. Oh, she lives. She's not going to. That's, that's okay. Okay, I can read the rest of it now. Well, folks, when you come to Jesus, when you read and understand and experience his eternal life coming into your life. You've read the end of the story. You know what happens. It is victory. It is living with him in glory. It, it is complete salva- our, our salvation completed in every way. And so we can live. We can live even through the most difficult times in our lives. We can live with a different viewpoint, which will impact how we can stand, even this morning as we worshiped, and give glory to God and declare all my life you have been faithful, that you've been faithful up to this point. You are faithful today, Lord, whatever my circumstances are, and you will continue to be faithful into my future. An eternal perspective totally changes how you view what's going on in your life at the minute. And I think it's what Jesus talked to his disciples about in, you know, during that last meal before he went to the cross. And he talked to them about, you know, don't let your heart be troubled. I am leaving, but I'm going ahead of you. In my Father's house are many mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And as he talked to them about what was going to happen in the future. He says to them, I'm telling you these things so that you will not fall away. 
you won't. And, and I think that that is, and probably if you've ever heard Paul and I speaking, you'll know that, you know, in our Christian lives, probably one of the most painful things is for people that you loved, people that you still love, who once followed Jesus, who loved Jesus, who served Jesus, and who just have lost their way and have fallen away. And Jesus was saying to his disciples, these things, I'm talking to you about all of these things so that you will hang on through the hard times and that you will not give up and that you will stay on track. Because I think an eternal perspective is the thing that helps you remain focused in life right up until now. I think it helps you to have an eternal perspective on whatever current difficulties you might be facing. And I think the truth is sometimes when you get God's perspective on what is currently going on in your life, even sometimes it changes how you view those difficulties and how you view those problems. I mean, I know even for my own family, as I looked at cer certain ones in my own family and, and I defined them by their problems. And God really challenged me once and he said, Priscilla, let me give you my view of them. Let me, let me show you how I see them. Even though that's not the current reality, don't fix your eyes on what you can see. I want you to fix your eyes on what I see and then call that out from them. And so, you know, if you're praying for prodigals, if you're praying for family members, if you're praying about current difficulties and circumstances, say, Lord, give me your perspective on this. I know that I have a narrow perspective. Will you lift my eyes up? Give me your eternal perspective so that I can pray more effectively. I think it enables us to have a a different perspective on current difficulties. I believe it enables us and strengthens us not to give up, and it inspires us to pray because we know that what we see with our eyes isn't all that there is, that there is a spiritual dimension to life. And so I'm asking you today, what view did you wake up to? What, what was the vista that you wakened up to? And I believe this morning for some of you, God wants to come by the power of his Holy Spirit, and say, look up, look up. I wanna change the view that you're looking at, and I wanna change your mindset. And when that happens, I think then we live our lives with eternal priorities. We have a different set of priorities to other people. And I think when we have that eternal perspective, we understand that we need to depend on the Holy Spirit. I mean, over and over and over again these days, I just am increasingly realizing that as the people of God, we are not clever enough, we are not insightful enough, we don't have the, the most wonderful strategies to make a difference in our world. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to keep Him as a priority at the center of everything that we do so that we're not building in our own strength. Because if we do that, then it is the equivalent of building with wood, hay, and stubble that Paul talked about. And that, that's temporary. That, that does get burnt up. But when we build with the power of the Holy Spirit, not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty, when we build with His power, depending on Him, then, again, an eternal priority says, this is not just a temporary fix. This is not just a temporary solution. This has eternal significance. And so I would say that one of the ways that we live out those eternal priorities is to say, as a church and as individuals, Lord, we need you. We need the power of your Holy Spirit leading us, guiding us, empowering us every step of the way. We need a dependence on the Holy Spirit. Eternal priorities come when we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. That's what Hebrews 3, 1 tells us. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in a heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus that we don't get distracted, 
that we don't even get distracted with the vision. You know, God is moving here in Kings. He's moving here in Aberdeen. He is moving you on to an even greater place of influence, even on the brink of m moving buildings and all so, so many things happening in the church. But God says, don't get distracted. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And we do hear stories of people who would be well-known and prominent even within the Christian world in these days with social media and everything else. We hear all of the stories and we can hear of people who are falling away, who are failing and, and, and who aren't serving the Lord anymore. And there can be all sorts of reasons for that. But I can be absolutely sure that if you dig into it, somewhere along the line, they got their eyes off Jesus. They got their eyes off Him. And I know it happens to me as well. And it happens so subtly, and it happens so easily. You just get busy. You get involved in other things. You get involved in life. And suddenly, you just get your eyes off Him. And things start to change in your heart and your spirit. It impacts your relationships. It impacts everything that you do. And I often need the Lord to just come along and get my face in his hands again and say, come on, Priscilla, I want you to fix your eyes on me. You've got distracted. I want you to get focused on me again and keep our eyes on him. And then when we are depending on the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, when we have our eyes fixed on Jesus, when we have an eternal mindset and an eternal viewpoint, I think what happens is that it impacts our priorities because it impacts what we do with our money. It impacts what we do with our time. It impacts what we do with the abilities that God has given us. We use those things for Him and for His glory. It changes our priorities completely. Matthew 6, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we want to keep our minds fixed. My treasure is not here on this earth, but I am working um, because my treasure is in heaven. So Lord, here I am, who you've made me to be, the abilities that you've given me, the finance that you've released to me, the time that you've given me, I want to use it in order to build something that has eternal value. I don't want to spend my life decorating a hotel room. I want to spend my life building something and contributing to something that has eternal significance. And Paul talks about it here, that ultimately when we have that eternal mindset and that eternal viewpoint, he reminds us that it's all about eternal glory. The Bible has many descriptions of the glory of God from Moses on Mount Sinai to the prophetic visions of Isaiah and Ezekiel. The Mount of Transfiguration give the disciples an insight into the glory of Jesus. And then you go to John's visions in Revelation. Actually, I'm reading Revelation at the moment. I'm always, you know, trying to make sure that I cover all of Scripture whenever I'm, I'm doing my devotions. And I always come to Revelation so reluctantly. Because honestly, how anybody makes head or tail of that book, I have no idea. And I read the commentaries and I try to understand what's going on, but it's so hard to understand. But this time, one of the things that has really gripped my heart and gripped my soul is John's description of that heavenly vision, of the throne of God, of what is, going around, what is happening around the throne of God. It's almost as if his words and what he sees, it's so overwhelming. It's so majestic. It is so glorious that it is almost indescribable. 
by the human, by human language. And, and I think this time I've tried to concentrate on that, <coughs> on the glory that he is seeing. And you and I, from this promise in Colossians, it says we're going to share in his glory. There is an eternal glory. When Isaiah gets his vision, he, he hears the angels crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. We might think, you know, it should say the whole earth is filled with his holiness, but it says it's filled with his glory. And someone has described the glory of God as the manifest vision of God's holiness, that his glory is the manifest, that what you can see of the holiness of God, it's, it's a hard thing to describe. And yet, Jesus' prayer for the disciples in John 17 was to be with me where I am and to see my glory. We are going to share his glory. And Romans actually tells us, if we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And you know, there's something about glory too, which is about recognition. You know, we talk about the glory that someone gets when they win something or when they achieve something. And suffering and glory are linked together in Scripture. Paul says to the Corinthians, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Which again is a different perspective on the things that you're going through at the moment. That what Paul is saying is, you know, what we're going through one day when we are sharing in the glory of Christ and the glory of heaven, we will look back and think it was almost as if what we went through, the most painful things that we faced, we would describe them as light and momentary troubles in light of what we will receive. And so the challenge is that God wants us to live for his glory. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God, that we live our lives here and now. I suppose we live our lives here and now doing it in such a way to make God big in the eyes of the people that we live amongst. You know, we don't need to make him big. He is big, and, he, and God can take care of his own reputation, but yet at the same time, he wants us to live in a way that people look at our lives and go, wow, their God is so big. He is so amazing. He is so faithful. He is so loving. He is so forgiving. He, God wants us to live in a way that makes him look big in the eyes of people who don't know him. And so, as we come to an end this morning, I really believe that for us as individuals, that if we are going to be in this for the long haul, if we are going to keep going through the hard seasons of our lives, if King's Church is going to continue to make an impact on this city and on this nation, then ultimately, all of our vision needs to be underled with an eternal mindset and an eternal perspective so that we live out of eternal priorities. And so I'm going to pray in a moment, and I'm just going to invite the Lord to come and speak to each of our hearts. And I believe that there are some people here this morning, and you know that you need your vista, what you woke up to and looked at this morning, you need that to be changed. You need a fresh, eternal perspective on what's going on in your life at the minute. For some of us, that we know at the minute we've got our eyes off living for His glory, and we're struggling to make it, take the next step and the next step. And God wants us to come afresh to Him this morning and recommit our lives to Him and say, Lord, I want to live for your glory. And if there's anyone in the room and 
It's even been strange for you to hear somebody talking in terms of an eternal mindset, an eternal, a different view of life because you haven't met Jesus. Then God can change how you think this morning. He can change your heart. He can give you a different view of your life. And he can let you know the end of the story. That when you give your life to him, you will know that you are forgiven, you become a child of God, and your future is completely secure in him. And so I'm, I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to come and speak to us. And then after that, I'm just going to give you an opportunity to respond, to just stand. If you need a change of perspective, if you need to recommit yourself and say, Lord, I'm going to live again for your glory, and I am going to allow you to give me an eternal mindset, to choose an eternal mindset. I'm just going to give you an opportunity to stand and respond, and then I'll pray for you. So, Holy Spirit, will you move around the room right now? You know us, Lord. You know what we woke up with this morning. You know when we pull back the curtains, what view we looked out on. And for some of us, Lord, it was a very difficult view. And it is hard to keep going. But the truth is, Lord, you know that when we have an eternal perspective, that will change everything. Father, you know that some of us have just let things slip. We've got our eyes off Jesus, and we are no longer living for your glory. We're not giving our time and our money and our talents and our priorities to you. And Lord, we want to step back into line with you this morning. And for some, they just need to meet you for the first time and realize, Lord, that there's a totally different way of looking at life, that you died for us, that you rose again so that we could know you, so that we could live for you, so that we could know that our future is eternally secure. So Holy Spirit, just come and speak to our hearts right now in Jesus' name.